Good morning, everyone. It is great to be at Crossroads Fellowship. Uh, I'm glad you are uh, reading through the book of Mark during the summer. It, it's a worthy study and one that I hope you're taking seriously. I'm really glad we read through the entire chapter of Mark 3 uh, as we began this morning. And uh, let's just take a moment and break a little bit of that down. But before we do that, I want to say thank you to Cindy for inviting me to be your guest proclaimer today. It's always good to be with you, Cindy. Um, I know it's been uh, a tough year. And I'm so thankful for all the fathers in your world. And uh, we pray with you and your family today. I hope you'll take time to celebrate with your fathers, plural. Uh, we'll talk about fathers here in a minute as we talk about who is your family. Uh, you have uh, earthly fathers. You don't have much choice in that, and we'll talk about that again in a second. But uh, celebrate with your father. Be um, especially sure to celebrate with joy, no matter the circumstances. Um, have a spirit of joy as you celebrate today with fathers. I was pleased to see uh, the handout uh, as you came in today that talks about uh, the various verses of Mark that you'll be reading Monday through Friday. I've actually chosen to speak about the one that's for Friday. So here's our goal for the morning. I hope this morning you'll walk away with maybe a, a note or two that you can place in your Bible, um, take with you so that as you read then on Friday, you'll be able to reflect on what we've talked about today. So thank you all who have prepared that, and thank you to the crew that helps get ready for these sermons. So let's get to this morning. Who is my family is the question of the morning. Let's start by that overview of Mark chapter 3. We just read it. Uh, Mark wrote his gospel uh, maybe 30 years after Jesus' death and resurrection. So we're 30 years past Jesus' life on this earth. Uh, Mark wrote the gospel primarily to Gentiles, not Jews. He's not necessarily trying to connect all of the Old Testament prophecy to what he's trying to say. He's more trying to give us a look at who Jesus was on earth, what was his life like. Tell us, um, not an exact biography, but tell us about Jesus' life on this earth and what he was about and mix in some of Jesus' sermons or some of Jesus' teachings. And we see a little bit of that in Mark chapter 3. Mark writes in brief little steps. In fact, uh, he'll, he'll take a, a little vignette and talk about it. And then suddenly, and in fact he uses the word immediately often and throughout Mark, he moves to another vignette or another episode that he wants us to learn from. And so in Mark chapter 3, we see four or five of those episodes, and you're going to be reading about them Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. On Monday, you'll read about uh, Jesus sitting down uh, with the uh, religious leaders of the day at his footsteps, and they're in a conflict, if you will, about the Lord of the Sabbath. In fact, the NIV translation entitles this uh, section of the scripture, Lord of the Sabbath. He's in the synagogue, and there is a question about his healing a man with a shriveled hand on the Sabbath. Of course, the, the question for the religious authorities of the day is, 
what do you do on the Sabbath? Uh, you know, there were a whole list of rules and regulations about how to spend the Sabbath related to one's health. It was okay to help you along. For instance, if you cut your finger, you could put a Band-Aid on it and keep it from bleeding, but you couldn't sew it up or get it better. You, you, you could kind of hold the status quo, but let's don't move to improvement until after the Sabbath. So the man with the shriveled hand, they really couldn't heal the hand on the Sabbath in their uh, eyes, but then that hand could get better following the Sabbath, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Sabbath was Saturday. Well, Jesus had that argument and uh, having that conflict with the scholars, the religious authorities, we could spend all morning talking about that little section of Mark, but let's note, I want to focus on who is our family. So Mark skips and quickly moves Jesus out of the synagogue and moves him to the lake region. And the crowds followed Jesus because they knew of his healings. They knew of that healing power, and that was attractive to the people. They came from, well, you saw the regions where they came from, some traveling more than 100 miles. Think of 100 miles in Jesus' day and how long it would take to travel to follow Jesus. And they came attracted by that healing power. And Mark tells us that Jesus ask his follower, his, his helpers to get, have a boat ready because of the crowd that pressed against him. That's about what Mark tells us, and you'll read about that on your Tuesday reading. On Wednesday, we come to the appointing of the 12 apostles. Claudette, my wife, and I were talking about what I might try to do today in the sermon, and she said, well, here's a good one. She works with children, and she works specifically helping them with music a lot. She said, there's a little tune to the tune Jesus Loves Me that talks about the appointing of the 12 apostles. It goes something like this. Jesus called them one by one. Peter, Andrew, James, and John. I thought maybe we'd get the band to help us with that, and we'd just spend our whole time learning the name of the disciples. But You've heard my singing, and you know now why Ben is the worship leader and not I. And I decided against spending a lot of time trying to study about the disciples. But one thing I do want to note here, because it's important as we talk about family, Jesus selected folks from all across the spectrum of life. He had fishermen. He had tax collector who was making money for the Roman government. He had a zealot who was against the Roman government. And he put all of those folks in the same group of apostles. My, how crazy that group must have looked. Probably not the kind of group you and I would have chosen to lead a movement that Jesus was trying to do in his ministry on earth. So that's your Wednesday reading. Be ready for that. If you need the words of the song, I bet you can find it on Zoom, uh, on. Uh, <coughs> Facebook or somewhere, you'll find it. Then the next section, your Thursday reading, is about a conflict between the cosmic powers, Jesus and Satan. And Jesus is driving out demons. Jesus is accused of being possessed by Satan. And Jesus spends a little time speaking with uh, these followers who have accused him of being Satan, saying, how, how can Satan be against Satan. A kingdom divided cannot survive. And so you'll read about that on Thursday, and you'll see another small vignette about who Jesus was and how Jesus lived. But then we come to Friday, Friday's reading, and it's about Jesus' mother and his brothers. Um, brothers, James, Joseph, Judas, or Jude, and Simon. We see references to them in chapter 6 of Mark. We see also references to them in Matthew 13. So we know that Jesus had these brothers. Um, it brings us to the reading that I want to focus on this morning about family. So 
Let's turn to Mark chapter 3, verses 20 and 21 first, and then we'll move to the focal passage of 31 to 35. You have it on the screen, and I'll read it from here. Let's start in verses uh, 20 and 21, and this is the start of that passage about Jesus and Beelzebub, Satan versus Satan, Jesus being accused of uh, being uh, Satan. And here's the passage. Then Jesus entered a house. Notice Jesus goes from the synagogue to the lake, up on a mountainside to call the apostles, and then into a house. And a crowd gathered, maybe similar to here, except, of course, a lot smaller uh, room, so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. Uh, the crowd was so pressing. Uh, maybe they, there wasn't enough space. Maybe they couldn't get away to get a bite to eat. Uh, Mark is saying they weren't even able to eat. And when his family, that is Jesus' family, Heard, of him, uh, heard about this, they went to take charge of him. For they said, he is out of his mind. Well, now we skip to verses 31 and following our focal passage for the morning. Then, and that's the only transition Mark gives us from that conflict between Satan and Satan and the authorities. Mark says, then Jesus' mother and brothers arrived. Standing outside, they sent someone in to call him. A crowd was sitting around him, and they told him, your mother and brothers are outside looking for you. Who are my mother and my brothers, he asked. Then he looked at those seated in a circle around him and said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does, not, whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. Now you say, why are you picking that particular passage? It sounds like Jesus is turning away his earthly family and pushing away from them, and in fact, rejecting them. That's on first read. Let's don't read that quite so quickly, and uh, let's talk about what may be going on here. First of all, let's talk about our family of origin. Maybe you prefer to call that your earthly family. That's the one I mentioned earlier you didn't have much choice about. Uh, you were born into this world to earthly parents. You didn't choose them. You may have been reared by those earthly parents. You may be in that family with those earthly parents now, or you may not be. One or the other parents, or maybe both, may not be around any longer for any number of reasons. You may find yourself in an adopted family. You may find yourself with step family members. But whatever is the case, each one of us has an earthly family. Those are blood relatives, sometimes we call them, certainly other earthly relatives. And what does that family do? Well, they try to support us. They try to keep people from mistreating us. They do not want us to get hurt. They set limits to what is acceptable. Um, if we talk to these folks who've just come back from youth camp, and by the way, I'm surely glad you had such a good experience. I've heard already about how that went, and I'm proud of you for going and proud of you for the decisions you have made. And you were away from your earthly family, and you may not have had some of the same restrictions at camp that you may have had with your earthly family. Um, Let's talk about that earthly family for a second. I, this, I, I've had an opportunity to observe family some this summer, uh, spring and summer. Ben's family had four softball, baseball players at work 
throughout the spring and summer. Three in Little League and Ben in his high school coaching position. So Grandpa, Gramps as they call me, got to uh, be the chauffeur, if you will, the driver for some of these times. Ben made a, a spreadsheet for us. And he said, okay, we've got uh, grandchild number one with this set of games, grandchild number two with this set of games, grandchild number three with this set of games, dad with the coach, this set of games. And on some nights, we had four games in four places, uh, four different directions at four different times. I got to be uh, the driver. And on one of those occasions, driving my granddaughters to one of the games, I said, hey, I get to be the team bus driver. They said, oh no, Gramps, you're our private chauffeur. <laughs> I felt like I got a promotion. Uh, it, it felt pretty good. Um, so I, I, I get to watch those games. You've been to Little League games, particularly younger ones. Our, our oldest uh, was a nine-year-old. He was a nine-year-old. Our youngest was playing t-ball. And uh, parents are pulling for those kids vocally, aren't they? And they're saying, run as fast as you can. They're saying, swing the bat hard. They're saying, keep your eye on the ball. And sometimes these little ones playing have all kinds of other interests, like watching cement trucks out and driving by and not playing in the field. But our families are pulling for us, even to the point that they don't want us to get harmed or mistreated. So the umps are getting an earful because little one is being mistreated. Isn't that how earthly families do? And then for those of you, let's go back to youth camp for a second. When you're at home, aren't your parents, your earthly family telling you, well, it's okay to do this but that's the limit. Don't do any more. Or it's okay to wear this, but not that. Or you can color your hair this color, but not that color. Or our families are trying to look out the best for us. Do you think Jesus' earthly family was any different? Now remember, we don't know anything about Jesus' teenage years. We, we got to where he was in the temple, age 12, and, and then all of a sudden the Bible is silent until Jesus' earthly ministry. How about these four brothers? And what about Jesus' sisters? I guess technically all of them step brothers and sisters. Since Joseph was their father, God was Jesus' father, same mother, Mary, we won't get into too much technicality there, but this family is trying to take care of Jesus, protect Jesus, help him learn the ropes in the carpentry business. You and I know that Jesus was sinless, so he was perfect. He was always kind. He was doing everything he was told. He, he was the model child. What do you think those brothers and sisters thought of him? And what were the family relationships? What do you think that family was like? Well, back to our families. Our families spent a lot of time with us. Time that could be, could be spent doing a lot of other things. Our families spend a lot of money on us. Money that could be used in a variety of ways, good things, ministries, etc. But they choose to spend it on family. Isn't there a fine line there between prioritizing our family, which we all must do, and idolizing our family and doing maybe overboard what we should do. I think Jesus' family was just a lot like that. So Jesus now as an adult is healing a man with a withered hand and healing many others such that the press is so great at the lake he has to go out in a boat. Jesus is 
ex exhorting demons. Uh, he is in a conflict between the powers of God and the powers of Satan. Jesus is not getting a lot of sleep. Uh, Jesus may have a poor diet since he's not able to eat much. And all of his a sudden, his family gets concerned about him, wants to protect him, just like our families want to protect us, want to treat us right, and they go to him, and they, and they want to take him away. In fact, we read it in verses 20 and 21, as the, uh, when his family heard about this, this that is, that he had a crowd gathered around him, they went to take charge of him, for they said, he's out of his mind. They wanted to protect the family name. Remember who you are, have you been told that, as you headed out from school or headed out for work or headed out to college or headed out to just do life? Remember who you are. You're a Smith, you're a Baisden, you're an Abbey, you're a this, you're a that. They wanted to protect the family name. They also didn't want Jesus to be hurt. And you remember earlier in the passage, the Herodians and the Pharisees were trying to kill Jesus, find a way to kill him. That's the beginning of Jesus' path to the cross right here in Mark chapter 3. They didn't embrace Jesus' mission. They wanted Jesus in a comfortable, predictable, healthy world. And Jesus didn't want to stay in that world. That, that, Jesus was a risk taker. His family viewed his risks as senseless. And maybe they blamed the poor diet. Maybe they blamed lack of sleep. But they said, he is out of his mind. Well, that's the family of origin. And we come to verse 31. Then Jesus' mother and brothers arrived. Standing outside, they sent someone in to call him. Now, Jesus is seated with some followers, some disciples, some who are trying to learn from him, and they're in this small room. And Jesus' family intentionally stays outside and sends the message in. My wife is named Claudette. Tropical storm Claudette is raging today. It's going through the southeast. Later this afternoon, this Claudette and I are driving through the southeast to her home of Georgia to be with her family of origin. She serves up trouble everywhere she goes, whether it's, whether it's a tropical storm or live and in person. This family is coming to stir up some trouble, at least with their own family member. Can you imagine? They're standing outside the door, and they're sending in a messenger. Let's say they holler at Keith and say, Keith, would you get this message inside to Cindy? Uh, we need to talk to Cindy. And so Keith tells one of you, and one of you tell this group, and this group tells this group, and this group, and this group, and this group, and the message finally gets over here to Cindy, and hey, your family's outside and they want to see you. Now everybody in the room knows something's up. And Jesus is told, finally, hey, your family's outside and they want to see you. Jesus says, who are my mother and my brothers? Well, Again, on first reading, doesn't that sound like he's saying, ah, oh, that's not my family anymore. I've outgrown them. I've superseded them. I am no longer theirs. Who is my family? Who are my brother and my brothers? Then he looked at those seated in a circle around him and said, here are my mother and my brothers Whoever does what does whoever does God's will is my brother and sister 
and mother. Why does Mark include this passage right here? He's trying to show that discipleship is a deeper tie than family relationships. I'm talking earthly family relationships. In a sense, he's saying Jesus didn't displace his family, didn't reject his family. He enlarged his family. And he says, my family is a spiritual family. He's identif- Mark is identifying the priority of discipleship. So what binds together the family of Christ? It's not blood or kinship, it's faith. And as we sang about this morning, we are saved by God's grace and are in the family of God. We find true joy through this bond of love. We are one in the bond of Christ's love. So, as we compare earthly family to spiritual family, how can we identify true kinship? New Testament scholar, commentator William Barclay identifies four conditions for true kinship. He says true kinship, one, is found in a common experience. That is, anyone who does the will of God are forgiven sinners. Some of you who went to youth camp understand made professions of faith for the first time. Others of you, I understand, made recommitments to Christ, realizing what it means to be in the family of faith. I commend you for those decisions you have now had that common experience. We in this room can all have that common experience, being forgiven sinners, saved by the grace of God. That binds us together in a spiritual family. Number two, true kinship is found in a common interest. And that common interest is Jesus. God sent himself to earth in Jesus. We then become interested in who Jesus is, Jesus' ministry, our desire to know more about Jesus Christ. So we have a common interest. Third, true kinship is found in obedience. Discipleship means obeying Jesus. Family members were those who followed him in obedience, he's saying in this passage. Disciples were those varied personalities, but they loved one another because they all loved Jesus and tried to obey his teachings. That's who we are in a spiritual family. And four, true kinship is found in a common goal. You see, church is not an organization. It is a living organism. We can disagree radically about all the organization. Who are we going to select for leaders here? Who will be our leaders over here? How are we going to do worship in this place? How are we going to do worship in that place? How are we going to dress for worship in that place? How are we going to dress for worship in this place? How are we going to read the Bible and interpret the Bible? Well, that begins to narrow us down, bring us back together a bit, and we begin to say we have a common goal. Our common goal is fellowship in the kingdom of God based on our seeking to know Christ better and our seeking to bring others into the kingdom. That's why we gather as a spiritual family. Our spiritual kinship goes across all barriers. 
Galatians 3.28, there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. So now we have an example of our earthly family on the outside trying to say, Jesus, come out here. We want to see you. Reading between the lines, we want to rescue you. We want to save you. We want to keep you from getting yourself in big trouble. And then we have our spiritual family, those folks gathered around Jesus who were seeking to be his disciples, his followers. And Jesus is saying, who is my family? And the last verse there, whoever does God's will is my brother, sister, and mother. So how do we know we're doing God's will? Well, I spent my career uh, in theological education working primarily with undergraduates who are trying to decide, is God calling me to ministry as a vocation? What is God's will for my life? And we talked about all the various factors that could shape how we decide about God's will, where we live, where we go to school, what kind of occupation we follow, whom will we marry, and all of those bigger questions of God's will. Those are key and important, and I spent semesters teaching folks and talking with folks about how we do that. But this morning, I want to narrow that down to how do you know you're doing God's will today and tomorrow and Tuesday, even in the circumstances in which you already find yourselves. I'm going to suggest that doing God's will today, tomorrow, and the next day may be at odds with your earthly family, but not at odds with your spiritual family. They're going to be the supporters, encouragers, and at some point, each of us is going to have to decide, which is our priority? Who is my family? Is it my earthly family? Is it my spiritual family? The will of God is to bring about restoration and healing to the aggrieved and freedom to the oppressed. How do we know if we are doing the will of God and in the spiritual family. Five scriptures will help us find that. Let's look first at John 3.16. Here it is on the board. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Step one, to do God's will, repent of our sins. Believe in Christ. Know of God's salvation for us through Jesus Christ. So if you're asking yourself today, tomorrow, Tuesday, am I doing God's will? Are you repenting of your sins? Second, from 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 18, we give thanks in all circumstances for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Rejoice always. Pray and give thanks. Are you doing God's will? Are you rejoicing? Do you, do you live in a spirit of joy? Are you celebrating earthly family today in a spirit of joy? with fathers and father figures and family. Rejoice always, pray, and give thanks. That's how you know you're doing God's will today, tomorrow, the next day. Third, also from 1 Thessalonians, this time in chapter 4, verse 3, it is God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality. I broaden this interpretation to read, abstain from evil and do good. 
Are you doing God's will today, tomorrow, Tuesday? Well, how are you doing evil versus good? Are you intentionally abstaining from evil or are you doing good? Micah 6, 8 instructs us, He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Are you doing God's will today, tomorrow, Tuesday, Wednesday? Are you acting justly? Are you interested in justice in your community, in your country, in your world? And are you acting, taking steps to bring about that justice? Do you love mercy? Some translations, do you love kindness? Are you walking humbly with your God? That's how you know you're doing the will of God. And finally, from John chapter 15, my command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. Love each other in the way Jesus loves. So I'm a teacher, so I'm accustomed to uh, recapping. Some would say that means tell us what you just said. Okay, I'm going to tell you what I just said. We have earthly families and they are important to us. We should give them time and money and support and love and direction and encouragement and safety. Give thanks for our earthly families. Jesus did. But when pressed, remember that we have a spiritual family, which is our priority. All of us in this room, together. We have common experiences, common interests, common goals, and so forth. You've got those in your notes. We are to love God with everything we've got and to love each other. And when we do that, we know we are doing God's will. We are forgiven sinners, saved by grace, living in, with a spiritual family. That is our priority. So there will come times when this earthly family will have expectations and dreams that may be in conflict with the spiritual family. Our responsibility will be to wrestle with and determine, are we doing God's will? And if we are, we're in this spiritual family. Now, this spiritual family can sustain us, care for us, love us, support us in our times of struggle, in our times of loneliness, in our times of grief, that often this earthly family can't do. So the message of the morning is, who is my family? My family is the children of God. They are my brothers, my sisters, my mother, my father, God, our heavenly father. I pray that as you read through Mark and particularly Mark 3 this week, you will be reminded even on this Father's Day to give thanks for your earthly family, give thanks for your spiritual family, put your priority in doing the will of God. Would you pray with me? God, help us to repent of our sins. Help us to rejoice always, to pray, and to give thanks. 
Strengthen us so that we may abstain from evil and do good. Grant us your wisdom so that we might act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly in your presence. And may we love you with all our hearts, mind, soul, and strength. And love others just as you have loved us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.